All right. Well, <clears throat> it looks like it's noon, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome and thank you for coming to this next installment of the Friends of Bracken Library Virtual Lunch and Learn series. Um, a little bit about this series before we get into it. Um, well, actually, first off, my name is Nick Havranik, and I am the User Engagement Strategies Coordinator at University Libraries here at Ball State, and I'm also the Assistant to the Executive Secretary of the Friends of Bracken Library. Um, and this series is a Friends um, endeavor on the third Thursday of every month during the academic year um, that highlights a university library's service resource um, workshop um, that could help you in your research and your projects. And the programs are always free and open to the public. So if you know anyone who's interested in, a, in an upcoming event, uh, feel free to share the registration link. And just a heads up, you should have been warned at the beginning of this meeting, but the meeting is being recorded. Um, and that's because all of these events end up on the University Library's YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so about this specific event, so this is the Power of Maps Virtual Lunch and Learn. Uh, the description is maps are a medium for inspiring and changing how to view and navigate spaces, but maps also serve as informative and exciting storytelling devices. Maps represent a visual platform for users to create, engage in, define, and comprehend cultural and historic concepts related to the environment, human rights, language, income, inequality, urbanization, ethnicity, poverty, war, and education. So we're going to explore the map collection in this program featuring our guest speaker, Melissa Gentry, map collection supervisor here at Ball State University Libraries. And she's going to show us how education can be redefined through cartography. So without further ado, I will hand things off to Melissa Gentry. Hi, thank you so much for uh, attending this lunch and learn session. It's kind of a virtual tour of the map collection here in Bracken Library. So maps for me are the most compelling and complete learning object. Each line and shape and symbol represents some significant purpose. And as a visual learner, maps represent that familiar adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. And they are tools for more than just wayfinding. And since we're on this quote from J.R.R. Tolkien, I will do a little plug on the second floor west side of Bracken Library, outside the Archives and Special Collections. You will see a uh, an exhibit that is dedicated to J.R.R. Tolkien, including some maps that were um, donated by Fritz Dolak to the map collection. So maps are a medium for inspiring and changing how to view and navigate spaces but they also serve as dynamic storytelling devices. In fact, I've learned in my 23 years here at university libraries that people who love books almost always love maps. Maps allow their readers to create, engage in, define, and comprehend cultural and historic concepts related to a myriad of topics um, that Nick just listed. And just to give an example, um, in the years that I've been here at Bracken Library, we've um, used maps in over 40 different departments um, on campus. So um, with hundreds of different faculty. So you can see how they can be used in um, various ways across different topics. So the Ball State University Library's map collection is housed on the second floor of Bracken Library on the east side. It's a colorful center for exploring the world. It's one of the largest and most diverse map collections, not just in the state, but in the region. When Bracken Library opened in the fall of 1975, Paul Stout was hired to oversee the university's first organized map collection of 30,000 maps, most acquired from Vanderbilt University um, through the Defense Mapping Agency project, but about 7,000 of those maps were from Paul Stout's personal collection. In 1975, the maps were housed in what is the Dean's office today, located conveniently 
between two 1970s era smoking lounges that were available in the library at that time. Eventually the map collection moved next door to the larger government publication space that you see here on the floor plan. An atlas collection with over 2000 books is located just behind those elevators on the east side of the balcony next to the map collection. Most people think of road atlases, but we order current thematic atlases that students can use as visual aids for papers and presentations. And an atlas by definition is a book of maps, but I always recommend using atlases because they're easy to scan, but they're also full of not just maps, but charts, graphs, photographs that can be really invaluable as visual aids and present information in kind of a unique way. The map collection today has grown to include over 140,000 maps, historic atlases and gazetteers and other cartographic resources, both paper and digital versions. The maps are used as learning objects and visual aids by students from faculty in dozens of departments. Visitors can view maps covering the walls and the counters, but it's not a map museum. It is a working library. All of the maps in the collection can be checked out by students and faculty for research and learning. Drawers and drawers of map cabinets are filled with cities, states, islands, and countries published in hundreds of languages. Some are rare originals, some date back to the 1800s, and some are brand new, hot off the presses. I wanted to take a moment here in the presentation to celebrate some of the staff um, that are kind of the behind the scenes um, workings of the map collection. Julia and Julian and Anna have been cataloging thousands of maps each year so that they can be identified and borrowed via interlibrary loan um, from researchers around the world. And Jim and Blake and Tony scan maps on demand so that students can view and use them in research projects like site planning for the College of Architecture and Planning. When you walk up the spiral stairs in Brocken Library, look to the east and you will see the maps exhibited in the front windows of the balcony. Last summer, this, my student assistants in the map collection actually created an exhibit all about the World Cup um, tournament that was in, in, in Australia. Our exhibit commemorate heritage months like Black History Month, Asian American History Month, Native American History. Um, this is a custom map that we made for Italian American Heritage Month. And this is one that we made for October as well um, for breast cancer survivors, um, for breast cancer awareness. For Women's History Month this month, we are actually celebrating with this map of uh, the life of Jean Stratton Porter, who is a famous Indiana author and filmmaker. Maps from the collection are also used and displayed across campus, including the weekly Rinker Center for um, Culture, Rinker Center Culture Exchange Program and panel symposiums and featured in documentaries and immersive learning projects. Each summer, the map collection provides maps and educational activities for the Ball State Camp Adventure. The library's digital media repository provides open access to some of the most interesting maps. Users can view and download hundreds of maps, including this set of maps of the Mississippi River. You can track how the river's course has changed over time by looking at the different colors. We stretched out the maps so that visiting geography students could actually walk along the river all the way from Illinois down to Louisiana. National Geographic maps are a staple of the map collection. In recent years, their maps have focused on changing demographic and environmental factors um, around the world. In this case, you can see the projected loss of coastline as a result of global warming conditions. One of the oldest maps in the collection is one of the Ottoman Empire that dates back in, into the 1880s, and it is printed on fabric pieced together. Tony Heifel worked for the city of Muncie during its gas boom era, 
and he published um, a few maps of Muncie, and we're lucky to have those um, in our collection. And this one, I know it's kind of difficult to see on the screen, but if you look closely, this is showing downtown Muncie, and each of those white dots that you see on the map, those are gas wells um, that the city of Muncie actually lit during the gas boom era. Um, after they discovered natural gas in the era in the area, they lit these gas wells and Muncie became known as the magic city because excursions would come in on the railroads and walk around downtown to see the city all lit up with natural gas. Unfortunately, they did not know that they were wasting the gas. They wasted millions of dollars worth of natural gas. And then this is another Tony Heafel map. It's one of my favorites. Um, from right around the turn of the century. And so you can see the map on the left and then on the right, um, an architecture student actually highlighted where the streetcars were located versus where the inner, inner urban um, um, rail lines were located. So I thought that was kind of an interesting use of color on the map. We also have a nice set of aerial photography. This one is from 1941. Um, of Muncie, and we have um, some from the 1960s, 1980s, um, up into the 2000s. This one I like because you can see that at the site of Muncie Central today, there used to be a golf course, and I found this photograph of the actual golf course in Archives and Special Collection. It was called the Minatrista Golf Course. We have campus maps dating back to 1929. Um, this is Ball State University in 1978. Um, we sometimes refer to this as the Where's Waldo map of Ball State because there's all different kinds of activities that are happening. And so we um, always challenge students to find different things that are happening on the map. But you can see all the changes. Um, there's no bell tower. Um, if you look at the architecture building, it's kind of built as a cube before they added the section with the solar panels. Um, so you can see how the um, University has changed over time looking at these campus maps. And all of the Ball State campus maps are available on the digital media request. And then we have a nice collection of Sanborn maps from Muncie. And I've inserted these QR codes in case you want to um, look up some of these websites on your phone as we go along. This will take you to the Sanborn collection in the DMR. And it's very easy to use because there are built in tools like a Sanborn map locator that you can use in the collection to find out which map you might need to use for your research. Um, and then there's also um, a link to a Sanborn map tutorial that we created so that you know what all the different colors and all the different symbols mean. But basically, um, these maps were built over time, beginning around um, the time of the Civil War, and then they reproduced, they created new maps in spans of about 10 years. So these are really great, especially for studying history. You can go back and see what was happening with different structures and then see the changes over time. And so um, just for example, the, the pink buildings that you see here are made of brick. Yellow means that that building is made out of wood. And then that kind of greenish color that you see is typically found in blacksmith shops because it's a fireproof. Um, building. And then that blue that you see right there on the corner on Walnut Street, that means it's a building made of stone. And I just think these kinds of maps are interesting because if you look at this one from the 1880s, there's a toy store, there's a jewelry store with a photographer upstairs, there's a drugstore. So it's all specialty shops um, before we had the, the big one-stop shopping of like Walmart um, and Target today. So here's an example of the Ball Brothers factory. So you can see the first map of the factory in 1889, and then the progressive years, you can see how the changes have made and um, how it's grown over time. So it's a really good example of using Sanborn maps to depict the changes. And then we also use these maps, and I've again included the website. It's a website called Mapping Inequality. and um, it is um, related to maps that are called redlining maps. And these were maps that were made during the Great Depression. Um, agents of the federal gov government's Homeowners Loan Corporation created thousands of these neighborhood descriptions between 1935 and 1940. 
And then the descriptions have lasted um, into the modern era. So the HOLC staff members using data and evaluations organized by local real estate professionals, lenders, developers, and real estate appraisers um, in each city, they assigned grades to the different neighborhoods that reflected their quote, mortgage security that would then be de depicted on these color-coded maps. So I'll show you what um, some of them look like here if I fast forward a little bit. So this is what um, one of the one of the neighborhoods of Muncie would look like. And you can see the description of that neighborhood there on the left. Let me go back to the original here. So among the information for deciding the grades was the neighborhood's quality of housing, plumbing and sewer conditions, recent house sales and rent values, and crucially, the racial and ethnic identity and class of the residents. So as we looked at that color code, the pink areas are the ones um, that you see here, like this is Boyston. So these pink neighborhoods are the ones um, that you can see on the guide are depicted as um, being, sorry, as being the so-called worst neighborhoods. And the sad part about these maps is not only the, did these real estate descriptions continue, um, real estate agents would not um, sell houses um, to certain racial and ethnic groups based on these descriptions. So it was sort of segregation by design is what you ended up having in the city. And so if I fast forward, this is actually a diary. And this is just a, an example of how you can use different primary sources that are located in the library to do historical research. So this is a diary that I found in Archives and Special Collections. It's actually available at Muncie Public Library, but it has been scanned for the digital media repository here. So you can read this diary from Noreen Hawk, who was a working woman who lived in Muncie around the turn of the 20th century. And she described at Christmas time, going out to Boyston and getting children from Boyston and bringing them into the city for taffy pulls and they had charity um, Christmas presents for the children. And so I was just curious about the neighborhood of Boyston. So on these redlining maps of Muncie, you can see Boyston is the pink area on the right. And the, de the description of that neighborhood is on the left. And if you look down at the bottom, the detrimental influences, and that's a quote, I'm not I'm using that term. It's strictly foreign wire workers from the Indiana Steel and Wire, Belgians and Hungarians. So it's telling you um, about the residents of Boyston who live nearby in that factory um, just across the way there. So that I thought was interesting that Noreen Hawk, um, we learn a little bit from the diary and we learn a little bit from these red line maps about some of the neighborhoods and how they were viewed um, by the real estate agents during that. And this is um, a kind of a related um, website that is all about segregation by design. On this map, it's called Pink Houses, and it's named after that um, 1980s John Mellencamp um, song. And it's basically, an, again, related to the segregation by design. When they built the interstate highways, beginning in the late 1940s and 50s, many of the neighborhoods that they um, planned for the expansion of these interstate highways were based on racial, the racial information that they got from the redlining map. So many of the interstate highways um, basically um, de destroyed what was left of some of the, Af especially African-American neighborhoods during that time. So one of the um, um, most often questions that I get asked is which major or which students use the map collection the most? Um, most people would think it's probably geography or history. Um, we do get quite a bit of students from Teachers College as well. But one department that I think is really interesting in their use of the map collection is the English department. So English and creative writing students are encouraged to perform rhetorical analysis and to persuade their readers using primary sources that offer visual impact. So we work together to discover map, maps that quickly and easily convey a message about various topics. For example, color on a map can highlight geographic or demographic trends. And probably the most recognizable colors on a map, you are probably familiar with red states and blue states. 
So if we looked at, at these past presidential elections, which are represented on these maps here, you can see where um, one party had a line, landslide in the presidential election, like with Roosevelt back in the 1930s um, and with Reagan in the 1980s. And surprisingly, in 1972, perhaps surprisingly, um, with Richard Nixon. So color on a map, you can just easily, I love using maps like this because you can just easily see where something is happening. So the red states and the blue states in 2016 were a little bit depressing because of the majority of the registered voters. The ones that did not vote were the majority in all of these beige states. So that was very depressing in 2016 to look at all of these states, including Indiana, and the majority of the registered voters did not vote. So did not vote on the Electoral College in 2016. And the only demographic that really kind of aligned with one party or another was gun ownership that year. There was no real defined um, um, census of the analysis of voters having to, to do with um, anything about race or nationality or even education levels. It was just this one demographic of gun ownership that basically showed how that voter was going to vote. So I thought that was kind of interesting for 2016. And you can see when maps represent accurate data, the audience can just consider these dem demographic trends on their own, consider what the meaning is. So you can show them these maps and have the students think about why this was the way it was in 2016. And so we've actually taken this to um, English students and we create kind of top 10 lists and make these maps based on different demographic data. And we, when we do this in an English class, we go through about 20 to 25 different um, uh, topics for the demographic data. But today I just limited it to a few, just to give you an idea of how you can use color to really represent um, the meaning of something, some trend that is happening related to voters and elections. So in 2020, if you look to the left, you can see the red states and the blue states. And um, then you can see on this map, the um, life expectancy. So the highest life expectancy on the map and then the lowest life expectancy on the map and then compare those. And then if you look at this, you have the highest cases of teen pregnancy on the map. And again, just consider the demographic trends. So these are mostly Southern states. And what does that say about um, in women in particular related to teen pregnancy? And you can think about all the different issues related to that. Oops. I have a problem here with my hands on my side. Hmm. Well, <laughs> this is not good. And what happened? I apologize. There we go. So this map is highest um, high school dropout rates. Again, you're just seeing that same trend of those Southern states. And then these are, this one is probably unsurprising, again, with related to women's rights. These are the states that actually passed the, the 19th Amendment after 1920, after women already had the right to vote. So you may have been um, predicting a trend like that, but some of them are kind of surprising. Like this was the last state um, to have a woman serve in Congress. And it just happened in 2022 with Vermont. So sometimes the demographics are thrown off a little bit. And so that's something that we talk about with the English students. And then this is another example, again, with color on a map. So this is something we, we can show over time. If you, on in this particular place, you wanna be a blue state. Um, we're looking at obesity rates in the United States. So back in 1996, the entire country was blue. So the percentages were less than 25% were obese. And then if you look at that next inset map, 2001, you can see kind of Mississippi leading the way into that red zone. And then by 2006, most of the country is red. There's only a few blue states left. And then with this updated map, they actually even had to change the key. So with the older key, the highest percentage was 25%. And now the key has the lowest percentage is actually 21%. So you get, this is just a good example of how color 
can show change over time on a map. This one, you can easily see the 90 degree days. This is a prediction from the Washington Post about global warming and how many 90 degree days will we have by 2060. And I do wanna point out that the Washington Post and the New York Times and USA Today all have cartographers on their staff. So they're a really great resource for using maps, especially for English or to convey some kind of research message. And then another website that we use is Flight Radar 24. Um, and it's basically just a live view of all the flights that are happening. So if you pull it up right now, you'll see flights. It'll populate flights that are happening over Indiana. And you can kind of, again, look at trends. And it's, I think, a great way to teach, especially elementary students, about geography. You can pull up this map and look at the different countries. And this is just a screenshot that I took on the first day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So you can see all of the flights avoiding the Ukraine airspace. So it's just, again, a different way to learn a little geography. Here's what, um, screenshots from when the COVID um, flights, when the COVID um, pandemic was canceling flights. So you can see this is March of 2020 versus April of 2020 in North America and in Europe. And then this is an example where I used it. I took a screenshot when a hurricane was happening and you can see, and I actually, you can click on the different planes and it shows you their flight paths. And I actually clicked on this plane and found the NOAA Hurricane Hunter plane. So you can see its flight path. It's about the only plane that's actually venturing into that hurricane that was off the coast of Florida. I believe that was Hurricane Ian. And then everyone's probably seen these hurricane maps like the one of Dorian. But I think it's kind of interesting to think about, and this is one of the, um, the things that we talk about with um, the English department, is think about what's in the path of that hurricane. So when people have to evacuate, you think, oh, you just get in your car and leave. But think about like where gas stations are located, where nursing homes are located. Um, when a hurricane was headed toward North Carolina, they had issues with those huge pig farms where they have pits of pig manure, and how the hurricane is going to hit and how that's going to affect that area environmentally. So these are things that we think about when we're doing English classes. Um, and then in this- <clears throat> Melissa, this sorry. Yeah. We had a question. Uh, somebody wanted to know what the set of maps were called that you were showing in the last slide. Again. Oh, okay. Let me go back. I did forget to show you the um, website about that. So um, these maps are maps that we actually made and it's actually from a website called Map Loco. And the purpose of the website is to show states that you visited. There's also a countries website and you just click on the countries or click on the states and it populates a map for you. And then we teach English students just how to use that website. They create a top 10 list of whatever census data they wanna look up and they just click on the map and it creates those maps. So these are actually maps that we created in English classes. So one, like So for the example, for this one, um, you would just click on Vermont. For this one, we clicked on Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, and it changes that state's color. And then you just take a screenshot of the map and save it and use it for your research. So I did forget to mention that website, it's MapLoco. So we're using MapLoco in kind of a different way for our research. So thanks for asking that question. So this, in this section, I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that we've done around campus um, um, with some of the different professors. So this is actually, um, we had a first Thursday event back in 2016 that was called Cartography that we did with Dr. Seaman from the Department of Geography. His students made Indiana history maps. And then Hannah Barnes from the School of Art, her students created maps in a collection that is called Home and is actually available on um, the DMR. We'll get to that here in a second. And then this is another project that Dr. Seaman did with her, his students. He's done this for a few years now, working with the Whiteley Community Council. And there it's called Mapping Whiteley and they're literally mapping Whiteley. And so they're learning about the history. Um, it's They take oral histories from the community members and then they develop maps based on churches and schools and grocery stores that used to be located in Whiteley. So it's a really great project because it incorporates the community working with students together. 
Dr. Call does a topographic map analysis class where we take maps, topographic maps, um, and he has a nice set in the geography department and students learn to read topographic maps. Dr. Laura Romano has her students create story maps. So instead of writing an essay in her English class, they actually create a story map and write their essay in map form. And here's an example. I always try to um, play along with the students and make a map um, along with them. And in this situation, we use the, the Google mapping in the English classes. So this is the Night Lab story map and it's based on the Google Maps. Um, and I included the QR code there. And if you're interested in learning about how to make these maps um, in Google, you can just send me an email um, at the end. Um, and I did want to include this picture from Dr. Romano's class where one of her students was using his crutch as a map pointer, and I had to um, <laughs> document that. And then Dr. Dorshaw Stewart, she does a brave book assignment for social studies methods teachers. So these are teachers that are going to be teaching social studies, and you can imagine um, that climate today and how scary that can be. And so she calls this project Brave Book Mapping. And so they take a children's book from the Education, Music, and Media Center here downstairs in the basement, and then they create a map based on that book. And then we've also created websites related to these books that um, feature, so this is a, about Angel Island, and this is a website that tells the story of a local woman named Lucille Chan, who um, it tells her story and how she um, actually went through Angel Island when she came back to the United States. And then the School of Art, um, it's probably now one of our biggest users. And the, the best thing about the School of Art is these are students that are creating maps that donate them to our collection. So our collection is staying dynamic with some of these maps that they're donating. So this is from that um, Twin Archer event that we had for First Thursday. Hannah Barnes, her collection is now in the digital media repository. It's called Home. Um, so this student made a map of Crown Point to represent their home. There's another one that is actually based on antiquarian maps that are in our collection. This is a collection um, that's also available in the digital media repository from Heidi Jensen's drawing class. And I think this collection actually includes two different semesters of the drawing class um, assignment. This is Maggie Chambers class and they actually created cut paper maps. You can see these are beautiful um, cut paper maps. Again, most of these classes come to the map collection. They look around at all the different maps, get inspiration, and then they create a map of their own based on um, different assignments from different teachers. This is, again, from Maggie Chambers' class. I, the, the map on the left is actually a map of Christy Woods, and it's um, in the shape of the um, borer insect that actually infected Christy Woods and it identifies some of the trees that were infected um, by that. So I thought that was really clever. And then Barbara Giorgio's um, students, they create, they basically track their ac activities and where they go for three days. And then they map that out in an abstract way. And they take into account their mood and how they were feeling at different times. And so you can see on it's represented here in kind of an abstract way. You can immediately tell um, where they've gone sometimes because you can kind of see the shape of the campus buildings on them. And this is Mackenzie Goodman from the School of Art. Um, she was actually a play space artist to begin with and she um, did kind of an immersive learning project with art students where they made this map that is serving as our backgr background today on our PowerPoint. It's a map of the White River. And you can see they have a net. They went and collected objects from the White River and actually included that on the back of the map. And then this is um, last year when she was teaching at the School of Art. She had her students create maps. And this one was a map that was made into a box. And then Rachel Cohn has her students. Um, they made fictional maps. And these are some of the maps that are featured in the J.R.R. Tolkien exhibit. And they were actually assisted by a visiting cartographer that we had here at Ball State last year, 
Brindo Carvalho. And he has a beautiful um, collection of maps online. And he made this map while he was here in Indiana of Hawkins, Indiana. It's based on the fictional Hawkins, Indiana from Stranger Things. And Brenda was able to um, teach some of the art classes. This is Rachel Cohn's class. And these are some of the maps that he created. And he taught them how they can draw um, fictional fantasy maps. And here's their collection that we put on display outside the map collection. And then a really great project that we started doing with the Intensive English Institute is um, Martina Chavo from the Culture Exchange Program down in Rinker. She has her Intensive English Institute students create a map of their home. So they come and visit the map collection, take a look around at some of their um, some of the maps that we have of their homes, and then they create their own maps. So we'll be adding those to the collection as well. And then these are um, not to be undone. The architecture students always create really beautiful maps. Um, the one on the left is a map, a 3D map of the Cliffs of Moor. And I literally begged the student to donate it to the collection, um, but she was giving it, I believe, to her grandparents. So I understand, but I at least got a photographic evidence of the map that they make. And this is a really great project on the right. Um, they came in and looked at really remote topographic maps from around the world and then re, um, reimagine that site in 3D. So you can see the, the rice paddies in Asia on the right. And then this is a Burris High School art student that made this map of Russia. And then this was a really great project from the Emerging um, Media and Design and Des Development School. Um, Molly Schaller um, was working in EMDD and she created these birdhouses that you see at the top and they have geocaching tags inside them. And she wrote about some of the um, notable women that we've been studying with the notable women of Muncie and Delaware County and included um, the geocaching, they have like pictures of the women, a little biography, and they're located in different spots. Um, there's one right outside Bracken Library. There's a birdhouse um, located right outside Bracken Library. Um, and it tells the story of one of the librarians that used to work here in Bracken. Um, there's one that features um, uh, um, Teresa Greenwood, Greenwood, who worked at Burris as well. So if you're into geocaching, you can look that up um, from Molly Schaller. And then we also take donations from faculty. This is from Professor Julie Thorson. Um, she was a philosophy professor. And these are cities she visited, and then she overlaid a self-portrait. And then I've actually created some maps. I have an entire set of Indiana history maps. Um, you can use the QR code or just Google putting Indiana history on the map. And so um, I was actually spurred by, I was motivated by a Burris elementary um, teacher who said that their, the maps that they had of Indiana history in their textbook were not great. And so I created um, a set of about 20 different Indiana history maps and we celebrated the Indiana Bicentennial. So you can see fashion, there's even a fashion map of Indiana. And obviously if you're making maps about Indiana, you have to include a map about basketball there. And then we've also got African-American women in Indiana history. So these are great maps because we can make them custom about the history that we want to teach. So they're more diverse than what you would find in this typical um, textbook. Here's one about Abraham Lincoln, um, one of our favorite sons of Indiana. And then I made a whole set that's related to women's history. So these are basically just um, someone's life story um, in map form. So here you have um, Anne Frank and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And then last summer, we even made a map about Barbie. And so making these maps, um, it's kind of opened up the world to me, the map collection, you can um, view the world and I've been able to view the world too. Um, making, I was making maps for the suffrage centennial in 2020, and then it ended up being 2021 as well because of the pandemic. And I was invited to the Library of Congress um, for their opening of their suffrage exhibit based on the um, suffrage maps that I made. And I included the QR code there if you're interested in looking at those. And 
I've used those um, in a collaboration with the League of Women Voters um, to just um, encourage voter registration. And then with the Notable Women of Muncie project, I created this um, walking tour of downtown. Um, we're gonna actually be doing the actual walking tour this summer, so be on the lookout for that. And these are all the different um, programs that I've been able to do, just um, presenting about maps, kind of like what I'm doing today. So I feel like it's really opened up a world and the community to me um, to be able to present different programs about maps. Um, these are some that I presented at Cornerstone. I did some about um, sports history, architecture history related to women. And once I find a good title for a program, oftentimes I use it over and over again. Um, this is one I call the woman's place, and this is a shameless plug. Um, if you're available next Thursday at 1, we'll be taking a virtual walking tour related to Ball State Women's History next Thursday, um, just downstairs in room 104. And that's in celebration of Women's Week. So these are just some of the um, libraries and projects that I've been able to um, collaborate with. Um, we had a London documentary film that was uh, making a film about the um, Battle of the Atlantic. We were even... Um, the featured in Netflix um, 13, the musical. If you've ever seen that TV show, um, it, there's a map um, from the map collection that they used um, as a decoration. One of the, it takes place in Indiana. Um, we were featured in Canada, Canada Memory Project where veterans did oral histories and we did a whole section about the Cuban Missile Crisis using maps from the collection. Um, you can see different museums. We've even been um, collaborating with the United Nations Library. So just a lot of different places. Um, we also um, send our maps to community schools, Muncie Community Schools, but also LeBron James School in Ohio actually borrowed some of the digital versions of our map. So that's kind of exciting. But this is one of my favorite um, inter interactions I had with a patron. I got an, an email and then a phone call from this um, Topher Mira, who's from Cape Cod, and he had found a map that we have of Cape Cod shipwrecks, um, shipwrecks around Cape Cod. And so he asked me to send a digital copy, and then he just printed off a version of the map to show everyone in town. And he said that your map is the talk of town here in Cape Cod. So that was kind of fun. And he sent us pictures of, um, he's in a Schooner Bums Association of Cape Cod. So he sent us pictures of his schooner. So I thought that was kind of fun. So hopefully you've enjoyed this kind of whirlwind trip around the map collection um, here in Bracken Library. And I'm not sure, Nick, Nick are we um, able to take questions or are there more questions in the chat? I'm happy to, an happy to answer them. Yeah, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or just ask them in chat. Um, I have a quick question. Um, thank you so much, uh, Melissa. This is a wonderful presentation. I really enjoy that very much. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I can say the visual map really uh, speaks a lot. <laughs> so uh, my question is very simple. I know that I know that you mentioned uh, Google Map, and um, if we want to use this kind of map uh, to, you know, uh, in our research, um, how can we um, do that? I'm not sure. And what kind of program you are using? And uh, is there any kind of like a, a training for us to use this kind of map? Yes, yeah. So we I do that with the English classes and women's and gender studies classes use them as well. Um, and some of the history classes are now starting to use them. It's basically just um, a Google Maps, but it's created through Northwestern. And it's called the Night Lab. And if you're interested in receiving the information, I'd be happy um, to, you can just email me, um, Melissa Gentry, and I'd be happy to send you, I've created a tutorial about it, um, so it's very easy to use. And there's also an associated timeline, which is really great. You can create a historical timeline and then a story map to go along with it. So it's really great to use. And I should mention too, um, if you're interested in using a more data-focused, Story map. Um, Lori 
in the GIS specialist in the map collection um, would be happy to help you with that as well. And you can contact the map collection um, where we have G a GIS specialist as well in case you want more interested in that too. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. I will email you. Thank you. Um, it looks like Robert Fritz said, excellent use of presentation software. What did you use? Oh, I just used PowerPoint. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it froze, but I guess that's not a great plug for it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Dale Fisher said, do you have Sanborn maps for towns in Delaware County other than Muncie? Um, we do have Yorktown. We do have a set for Yorktown. Most of the smaller towns, they just didn't make the maps. And I should mention that we do have other cities in Indiana in the collection as well. And you can also access the um, Sanborn maps on the Library of Congress now, which is very helpful. So most of the maps that were published, you can find on the Library of Congress. Um, if you're interested, you can email me. We have a list of all the towns in Indiana that were um, that they publish maps for, so you can contact me. Um, okay, Ashley Purvis said, thank you so much. Did these programs slash professors reach out to you or did you reach out to them? I love how collaborative this is, smiley face. <laughs> thank you, sometimes a little bit of both. Um, like Dr. Laura Romano was actually visiting the library with her students um, and she, she had a class with Joseph Roberts, one of the reference librarians, and they walked past the map collection, which it's great because when they had the library classes in 225, they walk past the map room and she just had questions about the map collection. Um, so he brought her in and that's um, how I started doing classes with her. But sometimes I um, reach out if I see there's an immersive learning project that might be able to use maps, I'll contact the professors myself. So it's a little bit of both. Hey, well, it looks like that's all the questions in chat. Unless somebody has a last minute question, I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. That was amazing. Thank I, you. I, I actually did have a question. So on some of the slides, you had uh, something in the corner that said Puck Wudgie. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's from the White River map. Um, the McKenzie Goodman class that made the map of the White River, they did research about the history of the river. And apparently there was a Bigfoot character um, and it was traditionally um, near Anderson or Chesterfield area. And the Bigfoot character was called Pukwudgie. So they included him on the map. Thanks for asking okay. that. <laughs> okay. It was a little confusing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what with that? I have a um, last question. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, so if, uh, for example, um, I put a, a you know the something in the map, but at the same time, well, I want to do a video introduction and put that uh, link of the video in that spot. I'm not sure it's uh, possible to add that function. I I I believe so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. If you want to email me, I'd be happy to help you with the oh, new year. All right. That all right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, all right. And with that, unless there are any more last minute questions, feel free to unmute yourself, but I'm going to try and end it. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you again for attending. And uh, this was the last event of this academic year. So we'll be picking the series up again in September of 2024. And yeah, and if you want this video, uh, the video of the meeting will be uploaded to the University Library's YouTube channel. So feel free to share it or rewatch it or, yeah, whatever you want to do with it. <laughs> um, thanks again for attending and have a great rest of your day.